Hi folks, and welcome to week four. Um, before we get into the topic for this week, let's just have a little bit of a chat about the assessment. Um, now, assessment one is a research exercise, sort of like a, a short essay. That's worth a thousand words and 30% of your overall uh, mark for the unit. Now this is looking at a specific case study. Um, I should also mention, as you can see up on the screen, it's due um, the 1st of September as well. Now, it's focused on a specific case study um, relating to a shooting incident that happened in King's Cross back in 2012. The specific details are of this case are explained in the learning guide and I think this week I've put up um, a link to a YouTube video of footage from the incident. Anyway, um, this assessment requires you to write a critical account in essay format of how this incident may have been prevented through one of the following crime prevention strategies um, which is listed below. Now we'll um, talk about um, preventive policing and crime prevention through environmental design uh, in um, the next few weeks. This week, we're looking at social prevention methods. So that's one of the possible strategies that you could use um, to examine um, that case study. Now, what you need to achieve in your writing of this assessment is demonstrate why the crime prevention strategy that you have chosen um, for this case is the best one and acknowledge any limitations of that particular approach. So, for example, if you were to go with the strategy from this week, social prevention, you'd need to explain why social prevention could help um, or would be a relevant prevention strategy uh, for this particular incident. And don't just say, oh yeah, I think it's a good strategy, actually you know, give a few reasons based on what the strengths and assumptions of the approach are. And yes, don't forget to mention the limitations as well. Now, um, you should keep in mind the publicity that surrounded um, this case. Um, different issues may have been raised by the media, police, um, political figures and so on. And this could be relevant to your crime prevention strategy. Remember, um, I've mentioned it um, a few weeks now, is that uh, prevention has this affective, symbolic dimension. Now, um, a little bit about uh, submitting the thing. You need to make sure you have at least eight academic sources. You can include some media research about the case study, so examples of discourse from newspapers and, and news media and so on, but these don't uh, go in place of your academic sources and you're also encouraged to use you know government policy documents statistics and so on and don't forget to submit the assessment through Turnitin anyway last week we were looking at um, the role of fear or fear and crime prevention and what we sort of learned I guess is that Fear as an affect, now remember affect, emotion, not effect. Fear as an affect is important in understanding certain um, crime prevention rationalities. And we looked at how fear has this dual function, right? There are two sides to the coin, so to speak. The fear of crime can be managed through crime prevention practices, right? So we use crime prevention to manage the problem of fear of crime. But the flip side of that is that the um, fear of crime can also be used in itself 
to manage or assist with crime prevention, right? And in this respect, we looked at the fear of crime functioning as a biopolitical strategy that citizens govern themselves by taking on and accepting governmental discourses about crime prevention. So, this responsibilized citizen takes on the management of their own risk reduction as a civic duty. In this way, the fear of crime works as a feedback loop. The more we try to manage the fear of crime, the more we seem to be affected by the fear of crime. So let's try and do a little bit of a synthesis here, okay? How might a biopolitics of fear relate to social prevention approaches? Now, what I want to suggest, um, a useful distinction you can make to help understand and contrast this week and last week's content, well, biopolitics seeks to address the behaviours of a population, right? Whereas social prevention seeks to address the propensities, the inclinations, right? The inclinations of would-be offenders. It's trying to make sure that um, individuals at risk of becoming offenders down the line don't actually become those offenders. So, in other words... Social prevention tries to address the nature or temperament of a person rather than their um, specific behaviours or practices at a given point in time. That approach, um, you know, addressing uh, someone's uh, decision-making and ability to offend at a specific um, place in time um, is what we will talk about in a bit more detail next week when we discuss situational crime prevention. But this week we're looking at social prevention, right? Addressing the propensities of would-be offenders. So, social prevention is about managing the risk of crime by preventing the production of motivated offenders. So this links back to um, Felsen's crime triangle discussed uh, in week two. Fear is used to ensure that targets in this crime triangle model manage their own risks. Fear in this way responsibilizes targets and demonizes offenders, although some more than others. On the other hand, social prevention addresses the subjectivity of individuals who are at risk of becoming offenders. If we go back to that crime triangle model, social prevention is addressing the motivated offender aspect, but using distal or um, more distant social structural factors and addressing those. Okay, now let's look at our overview for this week's lecture on social prevention. We're going to look at a few past examples. We're going to consider some of the strengths of this approach. We'll look at an example of a failed program to see some of the limitations or challenges of, of uh, social prevention. We're going to think about the role of design of um, interventions and some other implementation challenges. After that, we'll touch upon a public health typology that is used to refer to the level or scale of an intervention. And we're also going to have a think about some of the affective elements of 
prevention. We'll have a little bit of a consideration of the role of communities, some challenges overall with social prevention. We're going to touch upon issues to do with social class, and then we'll have a think about, um, or at least I'll mention, a successful Australian example. And they'll, there should be a link on views for this week's content um, to that um, particular program, so you can read a bit more about that. The first example we're going to look at is um, the Perry Preschool Project. Now I'm just going to go through this briefly, um, so, so we'll just look at some of the main points. Now the um, participants, those who uh, took part in this intervention, um, now this was an intervention that um, worked with preschool aged children basically, and they conducted a, um, a uh, longitudinal um, sort of cohort evaluation, basically they followed up the participants, you know, years and years and years later on down the track. And it turns out that um, those who um, took part were more likely to graduate from high school. They tended to have higher incomes at the age of 27 and 40. Why those ages, I'm not 100% sure. I just assume that's when they conducted the follow-up study. Um, they were less likely to be arrested uh, for committing a criminal offence. They were less likely to have relied on welfare. And the Perry Preschool Project was an intervention. Um, it was a preventive approach to social problems. You know, not, not crime specifically. Then we have the Elmira Program. Uh, in this one, nurses conducted regular prenatal and postnatal home visits um, with disadvantaged first-time teenage mothers. Now, based on the evaluation research, infants who were born to mothers who were taking part in the program um, experienced less physical abuse and neglect during the first two years of their life. And at age 15, there were less than half as many arrests in the program group as the control group. The control group being um, first-time disadvantaged teenage mothers uh, who were not given access to this intervention. Now we have a third example, and that's the Seattle Project. Now, this involved entire classes of primary school children. The children, teachers, and parents all took part in the programs under this project. For the children, um, the interventions involved enhancing their problem-solving skills and peer group interactions. Um, with regard to the adults in this program, the parents and teachers, um, they were trained or their their capacities for behavior management and group supervision were uh, developed further. Now, turns out that by the age of 18, young people in this program were less likely to report deviant behavior such as violence and heavy drinking. And the researchers have also established there were greater levels of school attachment and achievement. Um, young people tended to be more invested in school and um, achieved more. So what are some of the strengths um, of social prevention? I mean, it has um, a certain attraction to criminologists. Um, one thing is that it challenges the assumption or the belief um, that underlies a lot of our um, crime management and law and order thinking 
Um, and it's that belief that public shaming and social exclusion are the only um, effective mechanisms for reducing crime. Um, and what social prevention um, sort of aims at is effective inclusion in institutions to lower rates of offending. So when people are more invested in family, community, education, and so on, there tend to be lower rates of offending. Now, there's a social justice and equity element to this, um, but even if you don't care about that stuff at all, um, governments might be attracted to these what we call redistributive policies, right? Social prevention is about ensuring disadvantaged um, people get access to social resources um, that they don't have access to. Um, redistributive policies can help achieve a more law-abiding and secure society. So if you're taking that law and order politics angle, um, social prevention has an appeal there as well. Um, that said, you really need to focus on that um, law and order aspect because the image of tough leadership and law and order politics are, as you now probably let's be just aware, an easier sell to the an example of and the where social prevention didn't vague. Um, and it's the Cambridge Somerville you know, Youth Study uh, from the Structural US. Intervention. Um, this started in the 1930s and then was systematically reviewed over the following decades. And it serves as a warning not to rush into social programs. The follow-up studies showed that the target group actually scored worse on most measures when it came to having more extensive criminal records, less educational success, higher rates of mental illness, and higher suicide rates. So, m most of the participants actually appreciated the intervention, and they saw it as beneficial. But, it turns out that the process of singling out some disadvantaged young people for special attention actually had unintended negative consequences. One argument is that young males began to see themselves as potential delinquents. So those who were singled out for attention sort of reflected upon this and saw themselves as future offenders. And this links back to labeling theory and um, self-fulfilling prophecy. Um, so you may have come across that before or you will in um, other criminology units, but that's a possible explanation. And it's something to be aware of when implementing social prevention strategies. Now, what the Cambridge Somerville example shows us is that the implementation of social programs is as important as the content. How you deliver that program is just as important as what's actually in it. Now, the Perry Preschool example um, was actually looking at educational outcomes. It turns out that crime prevention was a collateral benefit. It was a positive unintended consequence. Now, there's something um, to think about at this stage. Should social prevention focus on individuals or social structures and institutions? Because um, there's consistent research showing associations between arrest and imprisonment rates and general indicators of disadvantage, such as unemployment, low income, early school, leaver status, physical and mental um, illness, and so on. And you may want to also have a think to how this relates to structural strain theory and blocked opportunities and all of that um, uh, thinking from Merton as well. Um, you may have come across that in other units. 
or you will in other CRIM units. But basically, given this link between general uh, signs of disadvantage and arrest and imprisonment rates, do we address individuals or the social structures and institutions around them as well? Um, that's just a thought to keep in the back of your mind. So a few more things to think about with regard to the challenges of implementation. From what we've looked at so far, um, one argument is that unless structural inequality is also addressed, programs that focus only on high-risk individuals, families and communities may actually have limited impacts of uh, offending incidence rates. Right? It's this problem of um, shuffling deck chairs, right? Program participants um, in these previous examples that we looked at, they were assisted with their social advancement, but this was at the expense of those people experiencing similar levels of disadvantage who received no assistance. So it's just sort of pushing the problem around, shuffling the deck chairs. Now, the cost benefits of social interventions are calculated or based on comparing program participants with equally disadvantaged people excluded from the program. So it's saying that you know, the cost benefit is based on comparing doing something with doing nothing at all. Now, this exclusion is a problem because the designers of, for example, the Perry Preschool pro uh, project, they wanted the scheme to eventually become universally accessible, not just selective, not just selecting out um, those with the most dire need. But the problem with universal projects is not just that they're costly, but they run counter to contemporary neoliberal political logic. You know, this whole push to reduce public spending, um, offload more responsibility to the private sector, and so on. Now, what I've got up here uh, on the slide is just a, a sort of diagram to help you um, see where social prevention sits with regard to some of the other concepts that we've uh, looked at so far this semester. In the middle of that diagram we have Felsen's uh, crime triangle um, based on the routine activities approach and you have the target, the motivated offender and the lack of capable guardianship. Now the situational prevention um, approaches that we'll look at next week um, focus on that green triangle in the middle. Um, the social structural factors are the more distal, right? The more distant um, contextual things. And whereas the uh, situational prevention relies on addressing immediate or proximal factors to make the motivated offender less inclined to make the risk or the, the benefit of committing crime not worth it. Social structural factors such, well, social prevention is looking at addressing things like inequality, weak attachments, poor social or decision-making skills and disadvantage to make sure that the motivated offender doesn't exist in the first place. Now, an analogy gets drawn between crime prevention and public health interventions. And there's this typology of primary, secondary, and um, tertiary prevention. Primary refers to the whole population, universal coverage. Secondary interventions refer to focusing on those groups at risk. And tertiary prevention refers to 
focusing on those groups that are already experiencing problems. So some examples of primary prevention um, <clears throat> excuse me, include ensuring children transition to formal education equipped with basic planning and problem-solving skills, parent and child bonding to develop parental attachment, um, public campaigns to change behaviours. Um, you may or may not um, remember the Violence Against Women Australia Says No campaign um, and community development initiatives, helping local neighbourhoods become more cohesive and exercise more effective informal social control. Now, social disorganisation theory um, plays a role in this thinking. Um, now, there are important correlates of violent crime, such as concentrated disadvantage, low residential stability, such as a transitory population. You may recall from the concentric zone theory, uh, the zone of transition. But um, if that doesn't mean anything to you yet, that's fine. Just some, some of you may be doing other crim courses. And high immigrant concentrations. And so that is probably to do with Durkheim's idea of anatomy, um, shifting and changing and different uh, social norms. However, um, despite this, neighbourhoods that experience these factors but are also just so happen to be close-knit and trusting communities with high levels of informal social control, so meaning that adults are more willing to intervene to control or correct young people's behaviour, tend to actually experience lower than expected rates of violence. <clears throat> Excuse me. So, social disorganisation, concentrated disadvantage, low residential stability, high uh, immigrant concentration. The flip side of that is social cohesiveness, right? Social cohesion tends to have a buffering effect in tight-knit communities, despite these risk factors. So, it's close-knit high levels of trust, and high levels of informal social control. Now you'll recall that secondary uh, prevention focuses on at-risk groups or populations. And these forms of prevention tend to appeal to governments as being cost-effective. Now risk assessment theory and techniques um, play into secondary prevention. And there are a couple of um, approaches in this regard, developmental and pathways approaches. So to cut a long story short with the developmental or trajectory approach, um, The um, key issues, such as impulsivity, poor social and problem-solving skills, poverty, uh, family history of crime and inadequate parental supervision, um, are common to the minority of people who um, accumulate serious criminal records. And the developmental approach argues that a lot of these key issues can actually be identified early on in life, like before or by the time a child reaches five years old. And it takes what you'd call a um, trajectory approach, saying that you have these key issues in place and then that sets you on a particular course in life toward potential um, criminality. So up here you can see my shoddy hand-drawn diagram to try and explain the trajectory approach. Hopefully it, I haven't made it more complicated than it needs to be, but basically um, it's saying that at by about five years you can identify some of these key factors and if left unattended um, 
you know, could or if left unaddressed could result in an individual leaning more towards criminality. Um, but if we intervene at that stage, um, we can prevent that from happening and then they'll drift towards less criminality. And you'll see that I've got different lines for advantaged background and disadvantaged background to recognize that um, you know, um, well-resourced um, communities uh, are going to drift towards less criminality for reasons that we've just um, discussed around social disorganization theory and social cohesiveness and so on. Now, another um, approach to secondary prevention takes a more pathways or phases or transitional approach. Because for some researchers, the trajectory metaphor kind of says, well, there's one steady march towards adulthood and it's fixed after early childhood, and that's it. That's the path you're going down, the end. Um, but of course, and I think it's fair enough to say that a lot of researchers say, well, that's a pretty simplistic model. And instead, you look at phases of transition. That life course is made up of certain phases, and in between phases, um, you go through a period of change to the next um, stage. Now, during these periods of transition, um, it's very uh, disruptive to an individual's subjectivity, um, and they experience challenges that could um, lead them to drift toward antisocial behavior. So again, I've made a little dodgy hand-drawn diagram for you, kind of like before, except you'll see in yellow um, highlight, I've got these sort of transition points. So this could be a young person starting a new school, moving to a new community, those sorts of life events. And at each point, um, you know, uh, depending on how well they cope with the challenges uh, that face them at that transition point, they could drift towards more or less uh, criminality. Um, this kind of is a bit similar, I think, in my view, to um, drift theory that some of you will probably encounter or have already encountered in juvenile crime and justice unit. Um, but hopefully you can appreciate that, you know, those transition points, you can see how um, each line, the green or the red one, splits um, to different, um, you know, possibilities at each transition point. And I think that that is a bit of a more sophisticated model than the trajectory one, which has basically just one transition point and then it's set in stone. Um, it just doesn't seem as um, realistic as this um, transitional model, in my view, anyway. And then there are also agency-based prevention or diversion measures used in secondary prevention. Um, and this is based on the uh, premise that mainstream institutions, such as schools and business and recreational organizations and so on, inadvertently generate deviance and delinquency, right? It's an unintended consequence of their normal functioning. One example is that schools with strong emphasis on academic achievement and ranking, um, who remembers the HSC and the whole ATAR business, um, in those sorts of schools, students who are less successful feel marginalized or devalued. So I went to a, a super competitive um, selective high school with a strong emphasis on academic achievement. Um, I uh, was uh, less successful in terms of what that school valued, which was becoming a lawyer or a medical doctor. So, um, you know, I deviated from that and became an academic um, instead. So, go make of that what you will. Anyway, uh, uh, jokes aside, um, this then ties in with Merton's uh, thinking around um, uh, young people uh, resorting to less legitimate means to achieve status or recognition, so that'll tie in with structural strain theory. So young people joining antisocial subcultures or 
taking antisocial um, or conducting antisocial practices to uh, gain fear and respect. So diversion identifies these individuals who are at risk of offending uh, to address factors likely to cause drift. So these could be things like self-esteem, lack of self-discipline, weak attachments, and so on. Now, the agency-based approach, you know, it says that normal everyday institutions actually um, inadvertently produce or generate uh, deviance. So it addresses these issues, not in everyday environments, but by enrolling young people in experiential learning programs and structured activities. So these are, you know, sports, outdoor activities, boot camps, and so on. Now, these interventions tend to be more ep episodic. They just occur. They're not an ongoing thing. Now, the evidence for this approach is actually not that extensive, and there are some indications that diversion approaches can be counterproductive uh, because there's this informal learning that goes on um, because you're putting a lot of high-risk youth together and they're not just going to be listening to the instructions from the structured program um, but they're, they're going to be talking to each other as well. And another challenge is that um, when you have these different agency-based interventions, um, you know, are they going to be coordinated or not, or are they just going to be episodic one-offs? And um, shameless self-plug here, but um, um, effective interagency cooperation or coordination um, requires dedicated and charismatic um, coordinators as well. So that's another uh, challenge. Um, in that context. Now this brings us over to tertiary prevention which involves a wide range of schemes but uh, basically it's about rehabilitating those who've already offended. Um, so this you could in some ways relate this back to the welfarist um, approach um, for those who are doing or have done juvenile crime and justice for example. But anyway, rehabilitating those who have already offended. Um, these programs can be prison or community-based. And in the Australian context, um, it's, uh, it's strongly emphasised by the restorative justice movement. And reintegrative shaming um, presents as an example of tertiary prevention by shaming or sanctioning individuals who've committed an offence followed by efforts to rehabilitate and reintegrate them into society. Now moving on from that public health typology, uh, let's come back to thinking about the affective aspects of social prevention. Crime and social control policy are always complex things. And decisions about policy um, or interventions, they need to function at two levels, the effective and the affective. Another way of putting that is uh, interventions need to work at the instrumental and the symbolic emotional levels. Now, this affective level is often overlooked by researchers and practitioners, but it can't be ignored. For example, the government of the day is always keyed in to what focus groups and opinion polls are telling them. So policies need to resonate with public perceptions and emotions. We may think that the public's perception is completely off and that the public is irrational and hysterical and so on and so on, but policies need to resonate with that. That's just how it works. So social prevention policies need to convey powerful symbolic messages particularly in the, the present context where there seems to be, well, there are always dominant pervasive cultural narratives, but at the moment it's, it tends to centre on the corrupting effects of urban life. Now, just a little bit of a philosophical point when it comes to interventions in communities. Uh, do communities pre-exist the interventions that engage them? 
or do communities emerge through these policy interventions, right? Chicken and the egg kind of thing. Um, in the U.S. context, um, community-based um, social preventions ended up becoming the uh, locus of power struggles between local residents and businesses, even though they were both centered on the common objective of crime prevention. Um, Skogan uh, classified um, this, uh, or classified uh, community participants into two categories, preservationists and insurgents. The preservationists um, tended to be more conservative. Uh, they insisted on intensive local policing, surveillance measures, coordinated resistance to lower cost housing and drug treatment facilities and so on. Whereas the insurgents represented more disadvantaged and marginalized elements of society and wanted to use prevention, intervention, funding to address structural problems like unemployment, racial discrimination, access to housing and health care. So attracting and controlling prevention funding ended up being of major symbolic importance for uh, different groups within the community to express and validate their worldviews. So in this respect, community interventions can be divisive rather than unifying. And it assumes that there's a coherent and singular community that exists outside of the interventions that seek to address them. But as the US example has suggested, multiple communities emerge to contest resources and symbolic hegemony. And there's a common uh, view that social prevention is the only viable crime reduction method because situational and environmental approaches only address the symptoms of crime. But we have to remember that crime refers to a diverse range of activities. And I might suggest that um, there's no such thing as crime in general there are only specific instances and forms of criminal acts or criminal activities. If we do talk about crime in general, it's only a very vague and hollow label. So we have to remember uh, to be quite specific about to what we are um, talking. Additionally, there's no evidence that individuals who are prevented from c committing opportunistic offences or those due to carelessness, such as drink driving, um, there's no evidence that if they get prevented from doing that, they then invariably look for some other opportunity to break the law. So, for example, um, situational preventions don't result in the would-be offender looking for some other way to break the law. So if you're prevented from drink driving by an immobilizer, do you then go out and look for somebody to assault? It's also worth keeping in mind that excessive social prevention can be interpreted as pressure to conform, and that can be stifling and restrictive. That said, the systematic delivery of basic resources that get taken for granted by middle-class populations to disadvantaged families with young children in many countries has resulted in surprisingly large reductions in crime involvement among those targeted by such programs. One of the key challenges, however, when it comes to social prevention is isolating those key ingredients to ensure that these are provided to the communities that need them. And just a quick comment on prevention and social class or socioeconomic status.
When middle or upper class people ensure their children cope with life's major challenges and transitions, they generally don't perceive themselves as practicing social crime prevention. It's only when this gets discussed in terms of disadvantaged populations that it gets framed as needing something extra, that we need research-based guidance and monitoring. Um, in other words, it's not considered social prevention when well-resourced, advantaged populations do it, but for some reason, when disadvantaged populations are engaged in such programs, we call it social crime prevention. So, you want to have a look at the link um, provided in this week's uh, materials to the Pathways to Prevention project. Um, I won't go into too much detail here now, but uh, it has had an influence on federal and state policy on early intervention. Basically, the key lessons are that we need to adopt a holistic approach to early intervention and understand how different contexts impact child development. So it argues for a plan-based approach. Identify how key institutions and agencies interact to enhance the developmental pathways of children. Now, again, back to research that I've conducted, um, we find that interagency coordination is enhanced by an engaged coordinator with excellent interpersonal skills, but tends to be constrained by resource competition and funding arrangements and allocations. So that's something to consider um, moving forward. So a summary of um, what we've looked at this week. We've covered a lot of material just to give you an overview. Uh, social prevention is a holistic approach to prevention, but it doesn't need to be named crime prevention to be effective. Don't forget that some of the early examples we discussed in the lecture were actually uh, about addressing inequality and educational outcomes. And in fact, labeling these things crime prevention uh, could be counterproductive. Um, it needs to be broad and inclusive instead. And you need to address structural issues about the social distribution of community resources. It's also worth remembering that it's a political process and that these uh, political dynamics shape crime prevention at various levels. It needs to be planned and negotiated with communities so that it's liberating rather than oppressive and empowering, not stigmatizing. And don't forget it needs to resonate at both the practical and the symbolic effective levels. The more social prevention is ingrained as a part of an everyday routine or practice in a community, the more effective these things tend to be. Now, there are just a few questions to think about over the following week. Is social prevention a viable approach to the control of crime, or is it too broad and macro level in its focus? What key theories and approaches underpin um, social developmental crime prevention? What evidence exists to support its effectiveness and its possible limitations? And how might the negative consequences of labelling children as at risk be avoided in social prevention initiatives that focus on early intervention? Now next week we are going to look at situational prevention. Um, the readings for next week are Clark, 1997, and Eck and Gourette, 2012. Have a look through those, and while preparing for next week, have a think about these three questions. What are the differences between social and situational prevention in terms of their theoretical and philosophical assumptions? Does situational prevention address proximal or distal factors? And think about the crime triangles from week two. All right, uh, good luck everyone and I'll catch you next week.